Thank you, Suzanne. Uh, finally, it's my pleasure to introduce Gloria Rockhold. Uh, Gloria is the Community Engagement Manager for the local Albemarle County Public Schools. Um, I first met Gloria through our work with a local network of Latino service providers called Creciendo Juntos, or Growing Together, uh, where she is the board chair and has been for a few years. Uh, with a pair of master's degrees, she is an educator, a mental health counselor, and a pillar of the local Latino community here in Charlottesville. Uh, Gloria is going to be talking to us about relationship building as the cornerstone. Gloria. Buen dia y muchas gracias. Thank you very much for having me here. I am very um, honored to join into this important conversation. Um, I feel like um, so many times we talk about what we as a community at large want our all of us to engage in. And there are times when we don't realize that there are these huge barriers that communities have. And they're just wondering, you know, it's like these communities are out there looking like from the sidelines. And um, they're just looking and they're watching and, they're, and their kids are coming in through our systems of, in, in our schools. And, and, and we sit there and wonder why they're not as engaged as we would like them to be engaged. And I think that the civic responsibility is one of the cornerstones of this great nation that we live in. And at times I feel like a lot of our students are a little bit marginalized and are a little bit locked out of the system. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about what a relationship looks like, um, relationships between um, our families and our school policies, for example, and relationships between what actions are actually trickling through our policies in order to make um, our children and our families feel more um, uh, how do you say, like more engaged or more um, at ease in engaging in the civic conversation that is so important to our communities, especially now that our communities of color are blending. Um, I see all of our children, a lot of times they're not only Latino or only African American or only white. And this new generation that's coming up sometimes, um, uh, we're still putting them in boxes. So by, by what mechanisms we have in the conversations that we have, a lot of times we are the barriers to um, that civic engagement that we so want. So um, let me, ah. so um, I want you to just think a little moment and think, what do you know? How do you know what others don't know? Think about that question. How do you know what others don't know? And then on the flip side, how do you know what you don't know? Think about that. Where do you go in your world to find information that causes you to be able to speak the same language as the majority or understand what civic engagement means with the language of those who want us to engage civically? Where do we go for that information? And how do we know that they know now, right? So we have a lot of um, you super intelligent people in this room that spend time studying what you think or what you see and what you observe. And then I, it, it's just at a certain point of time, all of those slices of knowledge add up to what we believe people don't know. And we are there to inform that conversation. So what are some of the barriers that we, or that I observe? So basically, I'm gonna be talking about how, how in working with the Latino community in the Charlottesville area, it's like, what are the, some of the barriers that I find that, um, that are just there? And sometimes we don't know that they don't know that it's there. So when we look at structural, um, when we look at structural issues or structural barriers, you know, the school system's expectation of our families of color or our immigrant families? How do, we, how do we convey to them what our expectation is and what tools are we giving them in order to fully engage with us? And why is it that sometimes, you know, I get teachers and say, I just don't understand why this child just never comes to school. Well, if that child misses this bus, there's no one in the community that can take them to school. So that is, for example, the, the, the knowledge from the, the ed educator, ed educator side is that what, are, what do they need to know? So that brings us to the, the, um, 
the expectations of, you know, engaging in the PTO, PTA, for example, which I believe is like the front line of civic engagement for parents to start modeling to our children. Because if our parents are not modeling civic engagement, it's very difficult to have that civic engagement, that first generation out. Those U.S. born kids that are now turning 18 and have the, um, the right to vote, they don't have that cultural peace that many of us take for granted. So without that cultural piece of understanding the value of voicing your vote, they may come from a, from a country where the civil war was at hand or a country where they understand that that vote doesn't really necessarily count. So where are we teaching or what, what for, where in our community are we finding that place to actually teach our families, to teach our children? Because I feel like that cultural, that civic engagement piece needs to have that family engagement component to it. So the expectation, there's another expectation of, of competency. So we assume many of our, our um, Latino families should understand why the, the school system wants them to support education by helping the kids with homework after school. We're assuming that those parents can read and write in English, and we're hoping they read and write in Spanish. And that's a hope. And that's not necessarily a knowledge that most teachers are um, understanding enough or, more or school systems are understanding enough in order to cause that true engagement. And then that the huge elephant in the room always is that cycle of poverty. I find many times um, school systems and teachers don't understand the effect of the cycle of poverty on this huge population that walks into our classrooms. So when we see these children and families walking in, we don't realize and we don't sometimes understand that that child didn't have breakfast, their parents are probably, well, all of these layers of issues that the child is bringing into the classroom. And sometimes it's just by understanding poverty, we are more um, prepared to embrace that that child or embrace that family into helping to um, navigate through our complex system in this country. So um, in the cultural aspects, you know, what, who, who are the students gathering the information from? And who are their peers? And what is happening? And how is it that all of a sudden we find a child who is U.S. born and on this perfect track to be a fabulous, uh, super engaged individual in our community and then something happens. And then that something that happens, all of a sudden, you know, we see them doing or making bad decisions. And those bad decisions have a repercussion in their families, in their communities, because that one child that's making decisions that are not necessarily positive is affecting the community. Because Latinos, we are very relational. We make our families when we don't have families, you know? People come from the same town in, um, in Honduras, they find the same neighborhood, the same street to live on, and all of a sudden, all those people are related. They're not really related, but for them, they're related for all practical purposes. So then teachers come to me and they go, I don't understand, there's like this tia and this tio and this aunt and uncle and all. the understanding of that, of that web of relationships, of how we find a way to make meaning to a meaningful um, stay or passing through this country. And sometimes I find that the teachers and the educational system is not, um, is not understanding what cultural aspects are guiding that the performance of that child or the engagement of that family within our, our, our system. And something that, um, that I think we always need to talk about is the culture of fear. Many of our children that are, um, that are uh, recent immigrants or that they, if they were born here in the mixed status families, their parents are, are riddled with fear. You know, they have a fear of coming into our school system because it's a, it's a government agency, uh, according to them. And they feel like, oh my God, I go in there and they might you know, all of these things might happen. It's just the concept of like, they believe all of these things. So we as an institution need to go back and go, no, it's not going to happen. Immigration is not gonna come and deport you just because you walk into our schools, for example. So, so those are the things that um, I need to, you know, just 
talk about the fear of a second grader. It, 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 just to give you an example, I run um, an after school program in the Southwood neighborhood. It's a neighborhood um, in the southern part of the county. It's 1,500 people live in a trailer park. And um, about I would say 80% of the, the residents are um, Latino or in a blended family status. Blended in terms of like a, a African-American with Latino, Latino with a, a Caucasian. So that kind of blend as opposed to mixed status blending. And um, so I asked this girl, I said, this little second grader, I go, oh, Nancy, I, I went to your house and I knocked on the door to see if you wanted to come to the after school program. And, and I knew you were in there, but why didn't you open the door? And she goes, well, every time my mother says it, every time somebody knocks on the door, not to answer and to go hide under the bed. Because if somebody, you know, it might be somebody trying to break our family apart. So I'm thinking, how can a second grader uh, survive or um, how can a second grader be um, successful in our school community with that kind of fear? You know, the, the, that culture of fear that we're not, we're not acknowledging. And sometimes just with the fact of acknowledging it, you break down the wall. You know, just by saying, I understand your fear, I see it, I, I, I get it. Just by as a, an administrator or a teacher saying that to a child or a family, then it's like, okay, they get it. So once they get it, then all of a sudden another form of engagement can happen. So um, when I look at policy and how policy, you know, how policy affects our family engagement or our engagement in the civic conversation or discourse. You know, I look at, um, you know, the policy of the federal government. Federal government says, yes, family engagement is an integral part in our educational system and in supporting our, our families through or our children through the educational process. We look at the state level, the same thing. Family engagement is right up there and also in the local level. <clears throat> family engagement is the key to having healthy, achieving human beings within our school system. But what are our schools actually measuring? Are they measuring family engagement? No, we're not measuring family engagement, but we'd like to say we are. We'd like to say that that's happening. It's just that the problem is that when you, you, when you bring the, you have the policy and it goes through all these layers of bureaucracy, and then you find who are the engaged families and who are not, those who are the engaged families are generally those families who have a higher level of educated parents, who understand the value of engaging, who understand the value of helping that child after school. And then you have this other group that is just a little lost or locked out. So I challenge you to think about those things. It's like, what are we doing? How are we, how are we as a community helping to say, walk our talk? We talk about civic engagement, we talk about these things, but then all of a sudden when, when Latinos want to get together and talk and, or organize, there's like this fear thing happening with the community at large. What are they going to do? How, you know, what's going to happen is that unknown. So again, it's like, how do you know that you don't know? Or how do you know what they know? It's like, how are we bringing that to the table and in the conversation of just asking, you know, or engaging them in different ways? So um, let, me, let me go on and talk about, a little bit about the relationships. Um, you know, I find, I find that knowledge is, is so important and, and having, um, you know, building capacity within, within family members because I find that if the families model engagement, if the family models that the children will follow, and even if it's not their biological parents, if their community starts modeling that, that, that important relationship and that important knowledge of how to become a citizen in this, in this country, where you are engaged in the process of leadership. It's like leadership building. How do we build leaders within our communities? So one of the things that I've, I've started doing is just, I'm, I'm looking for families or parents who will be the leaders. And I don't care about what your documentation says. I just know that you're a human being and you're, in, and you're responsible for if not only your kids, but your family's kids. And how can, how can I help you or how can the system help you become more um, uh, feel more of a sense of agency to be able to advocate for yourself or advocate for other members of your of your community so um, when we look at the school expectations again it's like you know school ex expectations are sometimes not realistic with who's, who's sitting in your classroom or who's coming into your school 
So we need to be a little bit more um, careful about that cultural competency. We talk a lot that we talk about that a lot. And at the same time, is cultural competency a core, you know, a core knowledge that our teachers at the um, coming out of our ed schools, do they have enough of that so that when they come into our classrooms, they're able to connect with our children and our families? A lot of our new teachers have no idea how to, how to connect with families. So what does that say about what we're teaching? So we're, we're saying that that's important, but then we're not following it up with, these, this is how you create relationships with people that don't look like you. And, and that's, what, that's what my observation is, is you know, how, what do you do? And how do you know that people don't know? Um, and th this is a picture of um, every year I bring two busloads of, of kids during spring break because I know many Latino families and many families um, don't have anything to do during spring break. So a lot of the parents have to take off work because who's going to take care of their kids? So on the Wednesday, um, right in the middle of the week, I get two buses and we bring them to UVA. One of the things that, uh, again, just to show you how we, we don't think in terms of how they think, um, we brought them here and they were like, this is the first, the first year, the first time many of these have ever come on grounds and they go, this is so nice. And, and then they, they were like, can anybody come here? That's another question. It's like, do you need permission to come into a public space? Again, we make assumptions that we know what a public space is and how it is for all of us. But see, we, we don't go beyond telling them that, yes, and I, and I say to them, it's like, yes, you can come to the, the, the lawn and you can bring your picnic, bring your music, and anyone who is a citizen of this country can come here because it's a public space. Just to give you an example of how do, how do we know that they don't know that? Do you see? So I challenge you to think about those things and, you know, how do you know that they don't know and, and how, do, how do I know that I don't know? So let's all just be a little bit um, more embracing of the fact that there are a lot of people that just have no idea what it's, what it's about. And, and, um, and the last slide is about engagement begins with families. And this is a picture of, a, um, a, in this neighborhood, we started an after school uh, program. I call it the academy. And um, the intention is to get the families in there. I want families in there sitting there while their kids are doing homework, while they're playing. I want them to be involved and I want them to take over. Because once the families start taking over these programs, then they will feel more empowered. Their, their voices, they will understand that their voices are just as powerful as anyone else's voices. So we all, by doing just a little bit, all of us, and understanding this, I think that um, our, our youth of color and our youth who... Um, come from very low socioeconomic environments are going to be able to find the voices through the relationships with their families and through what their families teach them. So um, I just wanted to thank everyone for allowing me to be in this conversation. And um, I, I encourage all kinds of questions. So thank you so much.